that's to wake you all up. I don't know which one. That's the light, I know it's not that. Comes from the Gospel of Mark. And as you know, the Gospel of Mark is our uh, year B lectionary that we follow so that we can get the focus on one of the Gospel writers' track about what they were thinking as they were recording the events that had happened to them throughout their experience with Jesus. And so, as last week, we're still in the first chapter. Uh, We're at Mark 1, verses 14 through 20. So let's take a look at what Mark has to offer us this day. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed them, followed him. Here ends the words of Mark. Thanks be to God. Friends, if you haven't figured it out already, our theme is, I'll make you fishers of men. Really? How odd. Not really. Fishing was a mainstay in Jesus' time. As we consider the mission of Jesus through the unique lens of Mark, we find ourselves most of the time in the early chapters at the Sea of Galilee. Hmm. Okay. Now, in first century kingdom harbors, they became sort of like urban oasis. They were just like today. The cities have the populace, and particularly cities that have a function, in this case, on the Sea of Galilee, becoming a harbor or a port for industry. Things are happening there, you see. Things are happening there. And for some reason, Mark focuses on this part. And historically, we can see that the harbors of first century Jesus strongly correlate with everything Mark does in his gospel. For instance, the Theta happened to be at the very inflow of the Jordan River. You find many of the stories that Mark account recounts are around the town of Bethsaida or the harbor. Um, Migdal, likely the village of Mary Magdalene, who may have actually been a refugee from, his, from their fish processing sweatshops. Hmm. Hear the word sweatshops? Interesting. But central to Mark's story was the larger harbor village of Capernaum. And that was introduced in our story today. Now, I think for a minute this morning, it's valuable for us to look historically around the industry of the Sea of Galilee during the time of Jesus. Why? Because I think it's going to give us just a little different lens or look onto how the disciples were called from there. 
the mindset of the men who I just read to you when Jesus said, come and follow me, it says they dropped what they were doing and followed him. Hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were 25 years worth of working for General Motors or the Ford Motor Company um, or one of the big three or Dow Chemical, a little closer to our, and you were 30 years in, and you had a fairly good and lucrative income, and furthermore, you liked your job, no show of hands, would you, when a stranger came, who they had only seen perhaps briefly and knew not much about, would you go, sure, I'll quit, let's go. That's what happened. It says so. They dropped their nets and followed him. Now, evangelicals uh, revel in the fact that that was only a divine intervention of God. Agreed, right? I mean, wouldn't it take a divine intervention of God for you to give up 30 years just before you get your retirement? I mean, I'm bringing it home here, gang. You see what I'm saying? You know, you've got two more years to full retirement with full benefits and whatever, and you are going to go, I'm with you. I want you to see how hard, in one sense, that must have been. From an evangelical perspective, you can understand that. God came into their hearts, called them, and the rest of their lives fell away, and they joyfully and gleefully and gladly went, okay, let's go. From a historical point of view, it went something like this. We know the fishing industry at that time was being restructured for export. All right. They're an urban harbor town that knew they had a good thing, and they were trying to expand and, in one sense, first century industrialize. So the majority of fish that were caught on the Sea of Galilee from the fishermen were salted and preserved, and the majority of it made into fish sauce for shipping across the Roman Empire. Mm, sounds like a business to me. Huh? Sound like us? I'm going on. All fishing had become state regulated for the benefit of the urban elite. Who were these elite? They were the Greeks and the Romans who had settled in Palestine after military conquest. The big boys now had power, and they liked fish. So if we regulate this, then we can also be in charge of all of the fishing industry in the Roman Empire. They controlled the sale of fishing leases. I mean, sometimes we never learn, do we? Look at the application brought forward here today. Okay, so the elite controlled the sale of fishing leases, but they didn't award them to individuals. They, they awarded them to what they called kinship cooperatives, family businesses that would kind of pay allegiance. At this time, it was Tiberius who was in charge, okay? So Simon and Andrew, who were brothers, must have paid and got a fishing lease because obviously when Jesus called them, like I just read you, they were doing their thing, all right? What else? The brothers Zebedee and their father, right? Because in the text this morning, Mark says <laughs> that they left their dad with the hired men, <laughs> and they went. So you can see that there were some of the former, not former, what do you call it? Future, there we go. The future disciples who were leasing 
their livelihood. Hmm. The transformation of their economy at this time now was made possible good stuff. Again, look at the comparison, gang. From the sale of the leases, the Roman government promised to improve their roads. <laughs> okay, improve their roads, um, give them more tools to do better fishing with. Uh, they gave them so-called first century factories <laughs> so that they could process the food better and faster. And we thought it was only us, you know? What happened was all of the individual fishermen who all of their lives had grown up in that area, all of those towns around there, to provide for their family by working as an independent contractor, if you will, were wiped out of business. And so we find the fishermen becoming the lower class status because they became merely the providers of a commodity to the well-off. Now, I don't know whether you have figured that out before or even contemplated that or wondering why you should. Hang with me here this morning. What had happened is many individual fishermen were in poverty. They were at the bottom of the social economic ladder through no fault of their own. The elite looked down on them. Anybody uh, recall the Roman poet Cicero? Everybody's heard of Cicero. Here's what he said. This is a quote. The fisherman is more miserable than any other profession. Now, because this image is used so often in scripture, I think we tend to look nostalgically at that, don't we? Oh, you know, Jesus' disciples were fishermen and whatever. Okay, put that historical context, okay, into Jesus' reading this morning of calling these guys. And maybe we understand something that'll apply to us. Hang on. It's into this climate and social context that Mark's story of the fishermen become the first followers of Jesus, not rabbis, priests, or Pharisees. Perhaps these men partly responded because they didn't have anything to lose. We don't know. But knowing the history of the time period and the economic and social conditions around there now, do you allow for that possibility? Maybe it made it easier for them to drop the nets and go with this man who they didn't really know, but they knew was coming into the lake shore to not create a disturbance, but certainly revolutionize their lives in some way that just might be better than what they were doing now, which was paying a whole lot of money for a temporary one-year lease so that they could fish and give all the fish away to rich people. Good morning. Now, I am not saying, I better put the disclaimer here, <laughs> I am not saying that Jesus did not inspire their hearts with a divine call. I am not saying that the holy God of all nations and all peoples did not in his omniscience know all of those details when he sent his son to call those particular individuals. You see, because all of that is part of the plan. My point here is there is always a social, earthly, if you will, context around every divine moment in your life. Ding, 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 there it is. 
That's how you bring that around home, right? God does not act solely and pick you up out of where he put you. He works within the context of where he put you in your life right now, today, tomorrow, yesterday upon reflection. And he may use those elements of where you are in your life, good, bad, or indifferent, for his glory. Hmm. I think when you look and you merge history of the planet Earth and the people that God has put on it with the willingness to acknowledge and believe, in our case, in a holy God and a Jesus Christ as Son, everything could make more sense to you in your life. Or not. <laughs> but I ask you to open your perspective or open the lens of your heart and your mind, by the way, this morning, to see that if we go and say, God called the 12 and it was miraculous. And boy, it was amazing. They just dropped everything and they rolled with him. Yes, they did. But there was a very human, contextual reason, perhaps, for why it was maybe a little bit easier for them to do that. Are you with me? Yeah, okay. If you're not, say amen. No. All right. Yeah, that's it. Does that make their call any less holy, any less significant? Did it change the course of history? No. It was God's divine call on their heart that they did not shut down but responded to is, has us sitting here today. There's no question about that. But here's the takeaway. What if, what if you allowed yourself right now in your life, like those boys did, to assess where, they, where you are in terms of where you live, the kind of lodging you have, the occupation that you are pursuing, even if it's retirement, the way you are pursuing it. If you looked at every aspect, your family connections, okay? Everything with God is intentional. Did you see the first two? He just said, follow me, and they went. The Zebedee family, think about that. They're in the boat with their dad. They have been, since the time they've been five years old, being in training to be fishermen. And yet, they got out of the boat and walked away from their father, their family, not knowing what the heck was going to happen to them. They had no idea, but they did it anyway. Hmm. So you look at your family structure and you contemplate today, what if God really called on my heart to move out of state and all your family was here? What if all your family is elsewhere in the country and you're here? You're the only ones here. You see? And God puts on your heart, you need to stay, even though your family is there. Do you see it? I, I'm trying to humanize these men, not discipleize them. They became the disciples that they were. We read about them today because of who they were and how they responded to God. The takeaway, I believe, is that we can say we serve a holy God. We come together this morning, and it is a comfort for us to worship together. I sense that. We are comfortable here. It is, remember the, the song, It is Good to Be Here? I love that song. Lord, it is good to be here. 
and it is. But you don't live here in the house of the Lord. You live there in the world. Who needs you? Who needs you? So can you relate this morning or reflect? I'm not even going to ask relate. That's too much of an ask for you, I believe. It's almost too much of an ask for me. But can you relate to perhaps why those disciples dropped and rolled with Jesus, not knowing what their fate would end up being, but saying, it must be going to be better than what I am doing now. Hmm. And the philosophical and the theological way to look at that is, isn't that the way it always is? When you answer the call of God, seriously, you know, you may feel on your heart from time to time, I, I think I need to step up and help this person out. Or I need, no, you know, gosh, God's tugging on my heart to do more in this area, even if it's for the community, you know. And what happens? Oh, but if I do that, then this will change and this will change, and this will change. I would have to give up this. I would have to think differently about this. And isn't it true, I don't want to see any hands because I'll put mine up, isn't it true that sometimes you go, uh, no, it's okay, God. I'll get back to you on that or ask me again later when I'm more ready. Ugh, there it is. If you just ask me again, it's a good thing you're asking me to do, but I can't do it right now. You understand. <laughs> and God in his infinite wisdom and grace and mercy does understand. In fact, he knew from day one that you were going to turn him down in the first place. What's the difference? Everybody sitting in these pews understand that God is a font of unending grace and mercy and forgiveness. Hands down. Grace, mercy, forgiveness. And so you can say, later, God, and know that when you realize, man, I should have done that. Look at that. If I would have been there, thus and so wouldn't have happened. Anybody? There's a little guilt there that's on you. But nonetheless, you have those thoughts, don't you? And here's the difference in the Christian walk in life as opposed to the, the nice philosophical, theological, sit-in-the-pew kind of life. If you are living the call like those men did, if you are living it, you are trying to incorporate it into your life, then, whether you fail or not, enter Peter, disciple, by the way, one of the twelve, by the way, okay? Walking on water, did you see that beautiful image, that piece of artwork? Peter was called, and when he went, Peter went with enthusiasm. Oh, wow, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm oh, yeah, I'm with you. Right? He was. Wow. And who, out of all of them, is the one? Uh-oh. And loses trust. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, get back in the boat, man. I got you. Just never mind. I know that was going to happen. It's okay. Don't dwell on it. And then we go to the garden and sitting around the fire. <laughs> Here's Pete. I never heard of the guy. <sighs> Who? Gee, no, no, I don't know him. It's not me. It must have been somebody else. Yeah. Okay. Peter knew what it was to fall short of the call. That's what it was, to fall short of God's call to him, right? And every time God saved him with grace and love, and what happened? He became somebody who helped grow and build the church of Jesus Christ, a failure. So here you are, I'll leave you with this. A call from Jesus is serious business on your heart. 
God didn't play around when that moment, wherever it was in your life, it could have been at five, it could have been coming to church with mom and dad for years, and at 15, there was that defining moment where somehow you said, why am I going to church? And somehow you folks answered that question at some time in your life. And it might have been because I was brought up to do that. It's what you do. Okay? Deeper than that, at a point when you question why you are here or why you are a Christian, that was your defining moment of call, just like the disciples in the fishing boats. And you're still sitting here, so you made it. Uh-oh. See, you did that. No turning back. And God knows that. And God will never separate himself from you, no matter what you think or what you do. But, here's the but, but, each day as you open your eyes, I hope that God is the first person in your sight line where you say, thank you God for another day. I know not what you have in store. Because I guarantee you those boys in the boat and on the shoreline were thinking that very thing. I don't know what you have in store, but I will try my best to walk with you. And that's all you need to do, unless it's lip service. And if it's lip service, I invite you to talk to God one more time and say, in my state where I am on this earth right now, help me to understand you better and follow you. And then, God, I will learn to roll with you wherever life takes you.